Hello and welcome to the latest edition of the Notes of a Farmer podcast brought to you by Yetter Farm Equipment. I'm John Doberstein, Senior Editor of no Till Farmer. In today's episode, Dennis Michelson and Michael Musselman, hosts of the podcast, Innovations in Your Fields, powered by New Fields Ag, interview no Till Farmer editor Frank Lesseter and Lesseter Media President Mike Lesseter about the evolution of no-till, the founding days of no-till farmer, and trends and technologies that help no-till practices grow across the U.S. They also discussed the vision behind Frank's first book about no-till, From Mavic to Mainstream, A History of No-Till Farming. With that, let's go to Dennis and Michael for part one of their wide-ranging interview. Welcome back to Innovations in Your Fields, powered by New Fields Ag. And oh my goodness, folks, do we have a treat for you today. Mr. Michael Musselman, when you get to talk to people who have been involved in a subject that everybody's talking about, and they've been doing it for over 50 years, that's quite a treat. Well, it's amazing, and uh, I've looked forward to this interview for a long time. And uh, today we get the opportunity to have uh, veterans of the industry and ag publication in the no-till space. Uh, the iconic Frank Lesseter and Mike Lesseter, his son, who has uh, joined the business a while and back and is working uh, very closely with his father to continue that legacy. So we're going to talk about some legacy today. We're going to talk about these innovations, you know. Um, I, we want to we want to talk with Frank about how's a guy in 1970 something uh, saying it's time to start a magazine about no till, and uh, he stood in the gap there and said let's do it and uh, it's been around 50 plus years so uh, we're going to take some time with the father and the son and uh, answer uh, answer they're ready to answer some questions for us give us some insights and. Um, this is just going to be a fun time. So uh, appreciate the opportunity for them. Uh, they were kindly gave of their time here, especially right ahead uh, here soon to the uh, strip tail conference uh, that's going to be going on. So we'll maybe have them talk about some of those things as we go too. But Dennis, yeah, this is going to be fun, exciting. Yeah, it, it's really crazy because if you look at the world of no till and the world of strip till, there have always been parts of the country where it was the way to do business. But we've been seeing that expand. And, you know, as a, a meteorologist with a background in statistical climatology, it makes even more sense nowadays, Michael, because statistically speaking, when it comes to weather, we are in an environment that is more similar to the early part, the first 50 years, if you will, of the previous century. And we remember from our history books what happened in the 30s, for instance, uh, when it came to agriculture. So the, the idea of minimum tillage uh, operations it will probably make more sense here even uh, going forward if the weather gets as wacky and unpredictable as we expect it to, um, just the natural cycles of things, let alone anything, if you want to talk about climate change or anything like that, it's just the natural changes alone that we're likely to see in the weather will make these practices even more important in the years to come. They definitely are. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and uh, welcome Frank and Mike Lesseter to the show today. Uh, Frank, uh, thanks for taking the time, Mike, also. And uh, to start it off today, um, just give us a real quick uh, idea of uh, when you came uh, on to uh, this topic in, uh, in the late 60s, early 70s, tell us about what brought you there and what brought you to that place in your history. Well, we were living in Chicago at the time and I was editing a Livestock Magazine, this is 1972, and I, I was getting kind of bored of what I was looking for, to do, and uh, there was a publisher in Milwaukee who decided they were gonna start No-Till Farmer. Now, my wife and I and, and Michael have owned it since 1982, but for the first nine years, I worked for somebody else, and then we bought it away from them. 
we talk about 50 years, 52 years in no-till. It's, uh, we're just saying I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, uh, so uh, anyway, age, we, age has its benefits, Frank. Yeah, we came, we came back. And we didn't own the publication for the first nine years, but I'm I'm still the only editor at No Till Farmers I've ever had for 52 years. That's got to be some amazing. kind of record. Before he's done, I know it, it it'll be a record here. It's unusual. That's amazing. That's amazing, and lots of awards that you've won uh, in between this time. And uh, um, we uh, we hope that you you're able to get many more and Mike in the future too. So. Um, Mike, uh, tell us a little bit about um, growing up uh, in the magazine world there and uh, what you decided to do in between coming back. How did you find yourself to come back into uh, into the magazine world and, and work with your dad? Sure. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll start it off by saying I was three years old when dad moved us to Wisconsin and no-till farmer felt like the fifth child in our family. I, I can barely remember a time that there wasn't a stack of farm magazines and no-till farmer on it. Dad's work, reading magazines every night um, as, as he continued to stay on top of all the trends out there. Um, I accompanied dad on some farm visits as a young boy. Um, were memorable and fun. And I loved the time back at the family farm in Michigan uh, Dad here was the first in six generations to leave the farm. Um, so I'm the first one that was born off of the farm. Oh, wow. Um, but it, I went to journalism school. I wanted to be a writer. Um, wasn't sure exactly what I wanted to do. But after after college, I went, I went to Chicago for 12 years in the manufacturing space. And um, it's been 20 years ago this fall, actually, I, I answered the call to come back to the family business. I wanted to work with mom and dad. Um, and we kind of got some new things going, acquired some publications, and we've been kind of on a, on a straight growth path ever since. But it all started with No-Till Farmer. That was a, the flagship of our company. Um, some other businesses didn't work out, but No-Till Farmer has been uh, the piece of, of the company ever since 1981. Frank, uh, talk a little bit about your background and how you, your background, um, both educationally and professionally, led to this career. I grew up on a centennial farm, about dairy farm, about 40 miles north of Detroit. Been in the family since 1855. Uh, it's now all houses. It's a suburban. It's always been a suburban area of Detroit and Pontiac. Um, was it? Went to Michigan State, was a dairy science major, and then uh, took all my electives. My, I, I didn't want to go home and milk cows. I didn't want to sell feed to dairymen. I want to do something else. So I had an advisor let me take all my uh, electives in journalism. My mother had been an English teacher. She had turned me into writing. And a farmer down the road from where I grew up taught me, got me involved in photography. So I started out working for the Michigan State University Extension Service for three years. Came to Milwaukee, edited the Massey Ferguson Farm Profit Magazine, which in those days went to about 400,000 farmers across the U.S. Then I went to Chicago for three and a half years, and edited a magazine on livestock, beef cattle and hogs and sheep, and then came back in 1972 and started with the first issue of No-Till Farmer. Now, there's people around who've written as long as I have, but I don't think, I don't know of anybody around who's had the same job all these years. Most people get promoted. I never got promoted. <laughs> well, it's interesting you say that about not going home to milk cows. I grew up on a dairy also, and we, we probably, it, it didn't work for me really to go home and milk cows. Uh, maybe uh, maybe in some cases, dairy is one of those things you do uh, that uh, you figure out maybe you aren't going to milk cows the rest of your life. But uh, really appreciate those comments on that and, and how the uh, farm and what you did there is the basis 
And it gave you the ability then to kind of catapult or step into uh, doing something still in ag. And, you know, there's a lot of people listening to us that probably would like to be farming, but didn't get to go back to the family farm. And um, I know I know that uh, that uh, in my family, we probably would have liked to uh, keep the beef cattle around and uh, keep the Simmental herd going. Uh, but we just were not able to. So um, we have to, sometimes we have to move on into the next opportunities. And and uh, that's a very interesting path you took there in terms of the livestock area, but then really finding your calling into the communication side of the field. i got to tell you about my dad. He, he thought I was crazy to leave this job in Chicago and move up here. Um, he thought it was nuts. And then later on, we no-tilled the home farm he Oh wow! around and uh, we had a tenant who farmed some of it and they no-tilled. Um, the other thing is he told me once you figured out it was easier to tell others how to farm than to do it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been in ag journalism forever. Frank was, uh, dad was 34 years old, had three kids and another soon on the way so grandpa was wondering what the hell are you doing catching your <laughs> good, see that. <laughs> good journalistic name to this no-till practice yeah that's a great story frank is... i gotta ask you because to be really good at what you do for over 50 years you not only have to be really good at what you do for over 50 years but you have to really passionately believe in what you're doing what was it about no-till the operational side of no-till that convinced you that this is worthy of a career? Well, I got sold on it for changing jobs by the publisher here in Milwaukee. I actually didn't know hardly anything about no-till. And uh, we got educated. Six of us went down to Kentucky on a chartered plane. And we spent three or four days with the people who really got no-till started in Kentucky, and that's how I learned. In fact, we went to work, and they had they had promised me we would go down on this trip. So the first question I had was, when are we going to go? And they said, well, we don't know. And I said, well, baloney, you guys said we're going to go. So we went a week later. I, I said, I don't know anything about this field, and you got to get me up to speed right now. So there, there was no no book on no-till, no, no resource really hit. You had to go there and experience it and then share it with others. So if you think about that time period, there was virtually no resource you could turn to and study up on it. Yeah, and what's interesting about that is I, I, I like your comment, Mike, about the idea of um, where you're, you're innovating in a field where it hasn't been done before. And by the nature of it, you just had to get in and be scrappy about it and go to it and figure it out, get educated. And uh, I think that that's a uh, great principle of the basis of your success was you had curiosity and you had a desire and you said, let's get with it. So um, that that's a, a really interesting uh, pathway to how you became very uh very adept and and, and learned uh, uh, to grow with it. We'll come back to the episode in a moment, but first I'd like to thank our podcast sponsor, Yetter Farm Equipment. Yetter Farm Equipment has been providing farmers with solutions since 1930. Today, Yetter is your answer for finding the tools and equipment you need to face today's production agriculture demands. The Yetter lineup includes a wide range of planter attachments for different planting conditions, several equipment options for fertilizer placement, and products that meet harvest time challenges. Yetter delivers a return on investment and in equipment that meets your needs and maximizes inputs. Visit them at yetterco.com. The other, the other thing was, is I didn't know anything about no-till, so I didn't have any biases. <laughs> right. and, uh, That's a great comment. I decided right from the start that we needed to do in-depth editorial and uh, do a quality job and tell people how they could make more money, how they could protect the environment, et cetera, with 
with no-till. I'll, I'll jump in just for a second, because I think it might be important to the rest of the business that we've turned into. Mm -hmm. Dad's editorial principle was that we're not going to go out there and tell you what to do. We're going we're gonna to understand the problems and then go to the audience and try to pull the solutions out of them. And that's a formula. If you do it, it's a formula that works. And I think we're doing it in our farm equipment division we have now. We have an equine division. And that's that's key to the the last, you know, every, every year since 1981, how we think that we, we have a different approach than some others out there. Not and to what, tell you what to do, but to draw out from, from their peers in another state, another part of the country, what that solution would be. And, and then what's you, interesting about that, Mike, is in your publications, I always notice that you have farmers that are doing no-till as part of the people that are the teachers. So it, it it's very good when you have the farmer saying, I've done this, it works for me, so it could work for someone else. And I think that's part of that teaching method that you came up with uh, from, from that regard. Well, the other thing is our philosophy here is our editors don't know anything. And because you've got to listen to the farmers and there's communicators around who think they know everything, including a few radio broadcasters. <laughs> <laughs> so our philosophy has always been learn. I've done, I've done stories on farms in all 50 states, and wow. I've never been on a farm that I didn't learn something. And it may be a great idea to try, or maybe a idea you wouldn't want to recommend to anybody else, but you learn something on everyone if you can keep your eyes open and keep quiet. <laughs> and it's not just the successes that he would report on. It was also the, the failures, the landmines, calling out the farmers, telling what landmines there were to hopefully let their peers avoid that same misstep. The amazing thing to me, gentlemen, is that this is what science is all about, and being a scientific geek. The changes don't come from the consensus. The changes come on the edges. The, the innovators, those daring people that try something, and we see it in the ag industry all the time. People try new things. If it works, they try it more on more acres. Was there, was there a point, though, Frank, when you really saw that tipping point that you saw, hey, this is not just useful in a dry land situation or whatever, or if you're trying to deal with heavy erosion uh, near a river valley, when was it that you started seeing enough of the results from ag producers to say, oh my goodness, we, there's something here that needs to be shared more with the ag community as a whole, because the way we're doing things, maybe there's a better way to do it. Yeah, and uh, a couple of things came up. We had inflation, we had high gas prices or high diesel prices, and people were looking to cut their costs, which meant cutting trips across the field. Uh, I just read a story today about a, a California rancher who's been to a no-till conference. And he got into no-till because uh, it was so wet, he couldn't get his crops planted. And somebody said, hey, there's a no-till planter sitting over here. He got it. Uh, some of his employees said, I don't think this is going to work. And he said, keep going. And well, one of the best corn crops they ever had, they got into no-till by accident. You might tell the Dwayne Beck story about moisture. And no yeah, we, we started the National No-Tillage Conference in 1993. And Dwayne Beck is kind of the godfather of no-till in the dry land area at Pierre, South Dakota. He runs a re he's retired now, but he runs a research facility over the years. And he made this comment at the very first no-till conference. And the comment was, you got, in South Dakota, we no-till to keep every inch of rain that falls. You guys in Ohio, no till to get rid of the moisture. So it, it works both ways. Very interesting. And we got uh, Dwayne coming. We got Dwayne coming back to our no till conference in uh, Louisville next 
January, he's going to speak on 25, what happened when he spoke at our conference 25 years ago. And an update on that. I'm, I'm just curious, Frank, has there been a time over this whole 50 years when you were a little surprised that more people were not adopting more, more of a no-till or a strip-till approach? Yeah, that's true, and it's actually still true today. In fact, it may be more important today than it was back then. But uh, when we started, we did a we did a national survey on how many acres of no till there was. Nineteen seventy two, there were three point three million acres, and today our best guess is it's at about one hundred and ten million acres. And we think by twenty twenty three, and this is just off the top of my head, that maybe we'll have. 148 million acres of no-till, which would make up 48% of the crop, uh, cash crop land. And worldwide, this would grow to almost 500 million acres of no-till. And then with strip-till, it's it's way behind, but maybe we get to 12 million acres by in the next six years. That was 2030, the 148? Yeah. And we, we made these projections back in 2018, so it's- Wow, okay. Yeah. yeah. What really turned no-till around was in the late 70s, early 80s, Monsanto came out with Roundup, which big problem with no-till in the early days, one of the big problems was weed control. People didn't know what to do. And so what Roundup happened, help, helped that. Then the other thing was you know, none of the major manufacturers were interested in no-till because they wanted to sell plows and discs and chisel plows and big horsepower tractors. Well, in the late 70s, John Deere said, well, I don't want to. one of our really good customers running a red planter from Case or whatever. And so they came out with the John Deere 750 drill, which made a big difference. All of a sudden, we could no-till soybeans in seven and a half inch rows instead of 30 inch rows. So those two things made a real difference in no-till in the early days. And I've heard you and others say that when John Deere came out with their own equipment specific for no-till, that's what legitimized it in a number of people's minds, right? Yes, no doubt about it. If John Deere is going to do it, it must work. They haven't always lived up to that promise, but that's what people thought <laughs> in those days. And yeah, I mean, weed control was, was was tough in the early days. I mean, mainly, well, you had paraquat, and paraquat was a burn down, and that would kill the kill whatever's grown in the field, and then you could no till into it. And the other ones that were really used a lot was atrazine and princip. And then, uh, another one that was used quite a bit early on was dicamba. But Velsicol had it in those days, and it kind of went away. And now dicamba has come back in the last three or four years, although there are some, certainly some uh, problems with drift with it. Hopefully, we'll get that solved. So, Frank, we know that ag producers are creatures of habit. And years ago, at a uh, seminar at Purdue that, that I was helping out at, they asked the farmer, it was early 80s, the lotto had just started, and they asked the farmer, they said, uh, hey, if you guys win the $2 million prize, the lotto prize, what are you going to do with it? And a guy raised his hand, he says, I farm until it was all gone. <laughs> we see... So many ag producers sticking with the same methods that were used year after year after year. And one of the biggest problems I see is at the coffee shop, they're going to start talking about you or they're going to start talking about how your fields look if you do something different than what everybody else is doing. In the early days of no-till, what was the chatter like for the first pioneers of no-till there at the coffee shop? Well, it was mainly that they accused them of trash farming. And uh, a lot of the, the early innovators were smart enough to put their first no-till 
couple crops back away from the road so people couldn't couldn't see it. But then the coffee shop thing is the no-tillers would, would go into the coffee shop and then the, there'd be a table of farmers there, see them come in, they'd start laughing. And, they, and the no-tiller might sit alone in the back of the cafe because he didn't want to sit at that table. But early on, a lot of guys said to me, I quit going to the coffee shops. I didn't have anything to do with it. There's an interesting story early on out of uh, North Carolina State Metal Hospital. And uh, a farmer w went, went by one day and they were, I think it was first year they ever tried no till and he was planting it into sod. And the farmer saw this and he went up and he asked for the general manager of the metal hospital. And he met with him and he said, hey, you got one, uh, you got a crazy guy down there planting corn in the sod. You better check on him. And then uh, the farmer said, or the administrator said, yeah, I will. But he knew what was going on. But then two or three months later, the farmer came back and he said, you know, that's that's working down there. Maybe I shouldn't have told you to do something about it, about the mental, the guy with some mental problems. The other thing is, you mentioned earlier, the innovators. And uh, no-tillers were definitely the early innovators. And it reminds me of a story, and I think this was in maybe the late 80s or early 90s. Caterpillar came out with the Challenger tractor on tracks. And an awful lot of no-tillers were, were buying these tractors on tracks. And I couldn't figure out why they were doing it, because they didn't really need it in their no-till. Uh, situation. And I finally decided the reason they're doing it is they're innovators. They want to try something new. Mm -hmm. Lots of lots of examples like that. In, in other, the no-tiller who had the first fast track JCB tractor. There's a lot of, a lot of those stories. But uh, Michael, you got your book in front of you, right? Yes. So look on the, um, look on the first page and, and read what Read Frank's dedication. That's that that kind of hits with Dennis's question. I would say, yeah. So this book is dedicated to the no-till pioneers that sat alone in the back of the coffee shops to avoid being laughed at by the die-hard, moldboard plowing fanatics who ridiculed no-tillages, ugly fields, and lazy farmers. That's the uh, introduction dedication in Frank's first book, from Maverick to Mainstream. A history of no-till farming uh, by founding no-till farmer uh, editor, and uh, it's a great book. Uh, and I I actually have the privilege of having a signed copy. Thank you, Frank. There you uh, go. That was given to me um, when I worked at Martin Till Industries, um, and so I uh, appreciate that. And this was written in uh, 2018. So. Um, from Maverick to Mainstream, A History of No-Till Farming is your first uh, first book uh, out, uh, written about six, seven years ago. And uh, it's, it's a really good compilation of many of the people that made no-till uh, what it is today, the pioneers. I mean, you see these black and white photos. You see these old stories. Uh, there's lots of projections. You've got in the numbers and, and so forth on no-till farming. And I really appreciate and respect that. There's um, So tell us about how you decided to write a book, even though you've, pro you've written, you'd written for 40 some years. How did you decide it's time to make a book? Well, we just, the book is really a compilation of what's been in No-Till Farmer over the years. There's very few original things in there that I wrote just for the book because we went back and picked them up. And uh, one of the neat things, and we get asked why we don't do this anymore, one of the neat things was all the modifications and adjustments made to equipment in the 80s and 70s and early 90s because farmers, they didn't like anything that was on the market for no-tilling. And so they would go to their farm shops and put things together. We did a story on a guy <coughs> who converted a combine into a no-till planter. And the reason we don't do these stories today is we've got better equipment and it's coming that it doesn't need to be modified or adjusted. So we've kind of gotten away from those old 
stories about how we, uh, photographs about how they fix these up in their own farm shops. Well, what I liked, what I like to see is the innovation that came with that. And here, this is what's very interesting. So there's two sides to innovation at times I see in, in, in the industry. And let's just take equipment, for example. Uh, one side of the innovation is the farmers say that they need to do something and they do it in the farm shop. And then other people follow that. And then even the equipment people come along and say, you know what, that looks really good. And they borrow or take the ideas and so forth and learn from them. The other side of it is, is when the implement people, the manufacturers have brought on some innovative people within their organizations that say, we're going to design equipment and get ahead of the game and lead the farmer into it. But often what we see is a farmer's ingenuity and innovation to say, let's do something and that sparks the idea uh for the rest uh, for the uh, you know for the rest of the people mike well, you had a comment uh, in interesting enough early on this was in the 60s before i was even involved with no-till but you look at corn planters those days and both case ih and john deere adapted uh planters that were built in the in farm shops I uh, was just going to add, Michael Dennis, one of the one of the coolest uh, comments I got about the book, we had it on a podcast ourselves years ago, was uh, Dr. Steve Savage, who's uh, done a lot of work in, in, in agriculture, he's a PhD, he's written for Forbes. He told us that, you know, the story here in this book, this is a, a story that not just, not just is relevant to no-till, but in all of ag and in all in any industry for that matter, because he said it was it shows how change is still possible, that there was a blueprint here of how to how to change even in an industry as well entrenched as ag was that that always stuck with me that uh, and I was thinking he's right. You know, there, if you read this, you get into you can see what the see how that change happened. And it was a monumental change from from the 1960s on. Well, up until no-till came along, the biggest uh, biggest improvement or advancement that took less time was seed corn. Went to hybrid varieties, and uh, no-till caught on even faster than uh, hybrid corn did. That's it for this episode of the No-Till Farmer podcast. We'd like to thank Dennis Michelson and Michael Musselman for taking the time to interview Mike and Frank about the history of no-till practices and where we stand today. We also want to thank our sponsor, Yitter Farm Equipment, for helping to make this podcast possible. A transcript of this episode and our archive of previous podcast episodes are both available at notillfarmer.com slash podcasts. If you're interested in the books Frank Lesseter has written about no-till, go to our website at notillfarmer.com, visit the store section, and go to the books section. For Frank and Mike Lesseter and our entire staff here at No-Till Farmer, I'm John Doberstein. Thanks for listening, keep no-tilling, and have a great day.